So again, find your big blue book, turn to page 830, or download the PDF for SAT practice test six that's posted in the chat. So I know you guys have already gone over some basic reading strategies for the reading portion of the SAT, but I want to make sure we review them just to make sure that you're not thrown off. All right, have our PowerPoint up here. So again, these are the resources we'll be using, the official study guide and the PDFs, which are available for free online. So the key strategies for SAT reading are a little bit complex, but once you've internalized them, they are going to save you so much time as you work your way through. Because I think the way that a lot of us want to do the reading passage, sort of naturally, is that we'll read everything, right? Then we'll just hop over to the questions and try to answer everything. The problem with that is, is that's a little bit like running a marathon while trying to hold water in your hands without spilling any. If you've read something, you sort of poured that knowledge in, but as you go over the questions, eventually you're gonna slip. You're going to lose some of the knowledge that you've gained. Unless you have a perfect photo recall memory, you're going to want to implement some more strategic reading practices than maybe you would in your everyday reading. So the first thing that we want to do when we come upon a passage in the SAT reading comp is we want to read the blurb. Uh, what's the blurb? The blurb is that little chunk of text right after the title, but right before the actual text starts. Before the passage starts, you're going to get like one or two sentences telling you what the passage is going to be about. If you read the blurb, even without reading the passage, you're going to have a good idea of the passage's main idea. What you want to do next is sort of sandwich the passage. We call it sandwiching because it's sort of like reading the first sentence and the last sentence of every paragraph. You're chunking your way through the passage, not reading the whole thing, but getting a general idea of the words and ideas being used here. So you're not totally thrown off later. So you're sandwiching the passage. We still haven't read it. We've read the blurb and we've read a couple sentences here and there, but we haven't read the whole thing. Now what we wanna do is skim and annotate the questions. What does annotate mean? Well, annotate just means that you're actually physically writing on the paper. That's all it means. These tests are yours. Once you get them, SAT doesn't want them back. They don't want the actual question sheets. Uh, you can scribble all over those. Don't scribble on the answer sheets, except in the prescribed buzzle, bubbles, but you can write all over to make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, you're gonna categorize these questions, doing sort of a bird's eye view you're going to categorize them into these following categories. These questions will either be broad questions that ask about the main idea of the passage. There'll be line questions or command of evidence questions. Those will refer to a specific section of the passage. Then we have our vocab and context questions. Those are exactly what they sound like. They want to know what words mean in their context. And then on some passages, you'll have graph or data interpretation questions. Those will just be asking you to interpret a graph or a graphic in light of the main idea of the passage. Those will happen most often on your hard science or your social science passages. From here, and remember, we still haven't read the passage. We've read the blurb, we've sandwiched it, and we've categorized our questions. At this point, you have one of two options. One is you can either lead with the passage, read the passage beginning, middle, and end, and answer the questions as you go, now that you have a good idea of the questions. What we're going to teach you tonight is to lead with the questions. 
this one far and away helps the most students. At this point, you're going to be going through the questions and only using the passage to get the information that you need. You're gonna sort of use it like a reference book. You're not gonna read the whole thing, right? You're going to just get to where you know the passage is talking about what you're interested in, and you're gonna take the information out as you need it. The passage is there to serve you, not the other way around. Now, when we're answering the questions, when we're answering the questions, we wanna go roughly in this order. Vocab and context questions, those are the ones you can solve based on reading almost none of the passage. You can just kind of read the immediate context of that word and you'll be able to answer these questions. Line questions also will not require you to read the whole passage. They're going to sort of offer like a cheat sheet of here specifically in the passage is where the thing I'm asking about is. Graph questions would be next. I put those in parentheses because you don't have those in every reading comp passage, but you do have the rest of these in every one. The thing you wanna say for last, most importantly, are the broad questions. Those questions are asking about the main idea of the passage, and we wanna only want to answer those once we've already made ourselves familiar with what the passage is saying. Now, when we're ready to answer these questions, let's say we're, we're ready to answer a line question or a broad question or a graph interpretation, these are the steps we're gonna to wanna to go through. And these may seem a little abstract right now, may feel like it's a little hard to follow, to memorize. Don't worry, um, we're going to be uploading this video to our YouTube channel. You'll be able to ch check it out later. And once you see me using these in practice, I'm sure it'll all come back and it's going to stick in your heads much better. Once you've seen it used, these strategies will sort of make sense. So the main thing we wanna do when we're ready to answer the questions is we wanna paraphrase the question. That means put it into our own words. We wanna paraphrase that question in our own words and we wanna focus on the action words. What are the key things to focus on about this passage? Now, then we want to find evidence within the passage with these paraphrased key words in mind. Sometimes the question will direct us to where in the passage we need to look. Sometimes we'll have to do a little bit more digging. Either way, we're going to look at the evidence with our own understanding of the question in mind. Then we're going to develop our own answer based on what we already know of the question and based on what we found in the evidence. We haven't even looked at the multiple choices yet but we're going to base our understanding here and our understanding here, and we're going to find the answer that connects them. Now, once you have your own answer, that completely flips the power structure, right? Now you're no longer going to the answer choices saying like, oh gosh, it's gotta be here somewhere. Like, I, I really hope I find something that makes sense. No, at this point, you already have an answer. And you're asking the question, what do you have for me? What do you have that already matches what I know about this passage? And that's it. Those are all the strategies for our writing, for, sorry, those are all the strategies for our reading comprehension. So now I wanna take you through, again, what I call the, the double header passages. These are the passages that tend to give students the most trouble. Uh, they're the ones that, they're the ones that just generally confuse students the most. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that the double headers are always historical passages. And it can be a little intimidating reading the words from Abraham Lincoln or Henry David Thoreau. Some of us might rather just read a story or even a science passage, because at least then we would have a graph to help us understand. But the double header passages are going to throw you into the deep end of some historical primary sources. And I'm going to pull up the one from SAT Practice Test 6. If you didn't catch this earlier, the link to SAT Practice Test 6 
The downloadable PDF is in the chat. And I'll let you know what the page number is as soon as I pulled up here. Okay, so the page number for this double header passage is on page 14 of the PDF. It's on page 14 of the PDF. It's on page 830 if you have the giant blue book. If you have the giant blue book, 830. On the PDF, we're here on page, on page 14. And right away, you probably see that this one is a little funny. Right away, we have this split into passage one and passage two. Now, if you take away nothing else from tonight, take away this strategy for the double header passages. Treat the double header passages like two different SAT passage tests. Treat these passages like two different tests and you'll have a much easier time. Otherwise, you're going to read all the way through passage one and then all the way through passage two and you'll be trying to hold them both in your head as you answer the questions about one or the other. If you treat them as two separate tests, it's gonna make it much easier on your brain. Now, the steps are much the same. The first step, as in any reading comp passage, is to read the blurb. So let's read the blurb for passage one. Passage one is adapted from Abraham Lincoln, addressed to the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield, Illinois, originally delivered in 1838. Often for these historical passages, this is kind of all we get. They don't give us much more than who said it, where they said it, and when they said it. Now we know that passage two is from Henry David Thoreau, but we're not really interested in passage two just yet. Right now, we're still looking at passage one. So what are we gonna do now? Now we're gonna start sandwiching the passage, right? We're gonna start going through and looking at sort of the first and last sentence of every paragraph, just to sort of chunk it out. Let every American, every lover of liberty, every well-wisher to his posterity, swear by the blood of the revolution never to violate in the least particular the laws of the country and never to tolerate their violation by others. Okay, so right away we see some sort of key ideas. Uh, we're not tolerating the violation of what? Of laws. The laws of this country are to be followed, apparently. Now we look at the end of this paragraph and it says, and in short, let it become the political religion of the nation and let the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the grave and the gay of all sexes and tongues and colors and conditions sacrifice unceasingly upon its altars. Well, I don't really know what its altars are yet, but that's fine. I'm just sandwiching right now. When I so pressingly urge a strict observance of all the laws, let me not be understood as saying there are no bad laws, nor that grievances may not arise for the redress of which no legal provisions have been made. All right, let's keep going. We're almost done with sandwiching passage one. There is no grievance that is a fit object of redress by mob law. Okay, so the author, Abe Lincoln, seems against mob law. In any case that arises, blah, 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 we're still just sandwiching. This last sentence is just really long. So we can just start out the semicolon if we want. Or it is wrong and therefore proper to be prohibited by legal enactments. And in neither case is the interposition of mob law either necessary, justifiable, or excusable. Okay, so that doesn't really give us any new information. We already knew Abe Lincoln was against mob law. Now, an important thing to note, we are not being asked what did Abe Lincoln believe generally? 
we're only allowed to consider what beliefs does Abe Lincoln make clear in this passage? So while it's a historical passage, it's not a history test. At the end of the day, it's still a reading test. So now, what do we do? We've read the blurb, we've sandwiched passage one. Now what we're going to do is read through our questions and start annotating. Not even worrying about passage two, we're skipping right past it. So it starts on question number 33. In passage one, Lincoln contends that breaking the law has which consequence? Okay, so this looks like a broad question at first. It looks like something I would have to save until the very end. But then when I look at the next one, it says which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? Okay, so I'm not actually being asked about the whole passage. I'm being asked about these particular lines. And we'll go over some tricks for these connected questions in just a second. But what I like to do, what I like to do to make sure I know that the questions are connected is I will just draw an arrow to note later that I shouldn't try to answer this one without answering this one, and sort of vice versa, the connected ideas. So those are, those are our line passages. Now, as we get into number 35, as used in line 24, urge most nearly means. Well, that's just asking us for the meaning of a word. So that's a vocab and context question. So we can solve those almost right away. Now, again, if I were annotating on my on test day, I would probably draw the arrow over here and I would probably write like a V over here for vocab and context. Question number 36 says, the sentence in lines 24 to 28, starting with when and ending in made, primarily serves which function in passage one? Okay, well that's asking about specific lines. So I know this right away is a line question. You see what this is? We're just doing a bird's eye view and going over the questions for passage one. Let's see if we have any more passage one questions. Okay, we have one more. So as used in line 32, observed most nearly means. So again, asking for the meaning of a word, we know that's a vocab and context and we can come to it almost right away. So let's go. to question number 35, our vocab and context, the ones that we can solve right away. As used in line 24, urge most nearly means. Okay, we're not going to look at the synonyms just yet. What we're going to do is find where urge is used in line 24, and then come up with our own synonyms of what might be placed in place of that word. So let's look at line 24. So I'm gonna get rid of these green lines here because that'll just distract us. Line 24, when I so pressingly urge a strict observance of all the laws, let me not be understood as saying there are no bad laws. All right, so Abe Lincoln is urging a strict observance of the laws. So what I like to do in this case, we can try and come up with synonyms for urge, but the thing about words is they have different meanings in different contexts. So what I like to do instead is actually cover up the word and ask myself, what words could sort of fit in that? when I so pressingly blank a strict observance of all the laws? Well, we might say that Abe Lincoln is pleading a strict observance of all the laws. He's, uh, he's encouraging a strict observance of all the laws. He's not quite ordering it, right? But he is asking very strongly 
that we follow the law. Now, with those synonyms in mind, let's go back to the question. Which of these most fits? Hasten, that would mean that we would actually have to be causing the observance of laws to happen. If you're familiar with making haste, uh, that means you're making it happen very quickly. Now, Abe Lincoln isn't causing us to observe the laws, so I don't like A. B is stimulate. Now, that would also mean that he would have to cause an effect in something or someone else. So I don't really like stimulate. Require? Well, that's more of that ordering, kind of commanding sort of, sort of use of the word. So the power, the power position of that word is, is wrong. It's off. So I don't really like C either. That really only leads me with D, advocate. That's the one that I want to go with. All right, now, we're not gonna answer these in order, remember? We're answering these in the order of which we can answer most quickly. I'm gonna get my, my book so I can just cross-reference here. Have the PDF and the book open at the same time. Okay, so let's look at our next vocab and context question for passage one. As used in line 32, observed most nearly means. All right, now we could probably think of a couple different synonyms of observed, but let's look at how it's used in the passage. Line 32. So reading a little bit of context, still while they continue in force for the sake of example, they should be religiously observed. What's the they that they're talking about? Well, let's, let's look at earlier in the sentence. I mean to say that although bad laws, if they exist, should be repealed as soon as possible, still while they continue in force for the sake of example, they should be religiously observed. All right, so now we have a better idea of the context. What we're talking about here, what we're talking about is following the laws, right? If we were to cover up the word observed, what, is, what does Lincoln want us to do with the laws? He wants us to follow them. He wants us to obey them. Those are some possible synonyms that we might come up with on our own. So when we look at what's available here, followed is the one that immediately sort of lines up with what we know already. Scrutinized means to look at very closely Contemplated means to think about very deliberately, and notice just kind of seem, means to look at. The tricky thing about this is that B, C, and D could all be synonyms of the word observed in other contexts. That's why the context is so crucial here. But since we're talking about laws, we know that A, followed, is the only one we're really concerned with. So we've answered both of our vocab and context questions. This leaves us with what's next. We don't have any broad questions really for, for number, for passage one. We don't have any broad questions. The only thing that's left is line questions. And if all things are equal, if we have one line question over here and another line question over there, I like to go in order because generally, these questions are going to go in the order that the passage gives the answers. What I mean is this, all the passage one questions happened at the beginning, right? All the passage two questions happened later. The same thing is true as we move through the passage. The questions over here are either going to be very broad about the whole passage, or they're gonna be about the very beginning of it. As we move further, 
we're going to get questions about later in the passage, like lines 24 to 28, as we see in number 36. So let's work through this together. We have 33 and 34. Now we remember what we noted about 33 and 34. These two questions are connected. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna first find some key words in problem number 33. In passage one, Lincoln contends that breaking the law has which consequence? Now, if you were asking yourself, what are, the, what are the key words going on here? Well, if this were any other passage, I'd encourage you to look at the name of who's saying this, but we know that everything in passage one is something that Lincoln said, so we don't really need to worry about that. What we're worrying about here is breaking the law and the consequence of breaking the law. Now, here's another thing we need to know. The reason that we need to put these action words in our own words is that the SAT is not going to give us the exact words of the question in the passage. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna be using some kind of synonym. So for example, you're not going to find a question, Mr. Anthony may have used this example already. You're not going to find a question that says, when in the passage was Mary sad? And then you look in the passage and you find a line that says, it was at this point that Mary was sad. No, they're not gonna make it that easy. What you're more likely to find is a line that says something like, it was at this point, Mary could no longer hold back her tears. That's a much more likely example. So we need to translate breaking the law and consequence into some key synonyms. If we think of consequence, we could probably think of punishment if we want to go very negative. We could think of result if we wanted to think of a more, more morally neutral kind of word for it, right? Breaking the law, uh, we might think of the word illegal, illegal activity, illicit activity, violation of statutes, if we wanted to get really fancy, right? So we're looking for illegal activity and the results of that. What are the consequences? Now, we could go hunting through the whole passage, trying to find what we need, but we don't need to because question number 34 makes it easy. It tells us, no, you don't have to look in the whole passage. It's in one of these four places in passage one. This is what we mean when we say lead with the questions. Don't just hunt through the passage as a whole. Use the map. Use the map that these questions are giving you. So we start with lines nine to 12, starting with let every man and ending with liberty. Let's try and find that in here. Let every man remember that to violate the law is to trample on the blood of his father and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. Oh, okay. Um, so what we're asking is do these selections have to do with these key words up here in question 33. Well, let's see. To violate the law, well, I like that. That, uh, that has to do very much with our, with our prompt, is to trample on the blood of his father and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. So what Lincoln's using here is obviously a metaphor, right? He doesn't mean that we're literally taking our dad's blood and stamping on it. Like that would be a literal translation of this. This isn't what he's talking about. Trampling the blood of his father um, and tearing the character of his children's liberty. Lincoln is talking about the past, 
with a, your father, like your ancestors, the present and the future liberty. So it means we're sort of disrespecting the, the heritage of our country when we break the law, is what Lincoln's saying here. All right, well, I like A so far. It seems to have to do with the results of the thing we were looking at, illegal activity. But let's see if we don't find anything better. Lines 22 to 23, starting with and let, ending with alters. Yeah, 20 to 23. And let the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the grave and the gay, of all sexes and tongues and colors and conditions, sacrifice unceasingly upon its altars. Well, I don't see anything in here about the violation of laws. And I don't see anything in here about, really about, about consequences. It's more of, something that Lincoln wants people to do. He wants all these people, which he really means everybody, to sacrifice upon the altars of what? Well, we could sort of go back here and see, okay, political religion of the nation. What does he mean by that? He means reverence for the laws. Okay, so he's talking about what people should do how people should follow the law in Lincoln's view, but he's not talking about the consequences of breaking it. Now, I did that just to show you that there is an answer to these questions, like what is he talking about sacrificing upon its altars, but you don't have to do that. As soon as we know this has nothing to do with the key words that we've picked out, we don't have to have anything to do with this. So lines 20 to 23, no, get out of here, option B. Let's look at option C, lines 33 to 35, starting with if such and ending with born with. If such arise, let proper legal provisions be made for them with the least possible delay, but till then, let them, if not too intolerable, be born with. So do you see anything in there about breaking the law? I don't. No, he's really saying that, again, that we should follow it. When he uses the phrase here, be born with, that doesn't mean birthing. That means, like, bear with me. It's that sort of bearing, be born with. Basically. Just keep following the laws, even if they're upsetting. Okay, so I think I know where Lincoln stands, right? And this is the great, this is the great thing about these passages. As we read these lines for clues, we're getting an idea of how the passage as a whole operates. Lines 36 to 37, starting with there and ending with law. getting to the end of passage one. There is no grievance that is a fit object of redress by mob law. All right, so he's saying that we shouldn't form mobs in order to solve the things wrong with our laws. Well, that doesn't really have to do with the consequences of breaking them. Again, he's just telling us what not to do. He's not telling us why. So our first instinct was correct. B, C, and D don't have anything to do with our key words in, in question number 33. A is our only real option. Now, so we've answered 34 without answering 33. So what does lines nine through 12 mean? Well, we've gone over this already, right? Let every man remember that to violate the law is to trample on the blood of his father and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. What Abe Lincoln is saying is that we are basically trashing our heritage as a country if 
we break the law, even if the law is unjust. So what are the consequences of that? We know the answer. Let's see which answers match with what we already know. A, it slows the repeal of bad laws. No, I, I didn't see that anywhere. It undermines and repudiates the nation's values. Okay, well, undermine sort of means to like cut away at, to kind of dirty it. And so if we're talking about the nation's values, that does seem to line up with what Lincoln says. Looking at C, it leads slowly but inexorably to rule by mob. No, he doesn't talk about mob rule in this passage, or at least in this section that we've been given. It creates divisions between social groups. I didn't see that anywhere, even in the wrong answers that we looked at. So B is our answer. You see how much easier that was than hunting through the passage, trying to find the right answer to 33, and then trying to find if what line we looked at was the line that they wanted us to look at in number 34. We can save a whole lot of time by only looking at the lines they point us to. Okay, question number 36. We're almost at the end of our passage one questions. The sentence in lines 24 to 28, starting with when and ending with made, primarily serves which function in passage one? Now, this makes us think that it's a line question, because it does mention the line. But when we're asked about the function it serves in the passage, that's much more of a broad type question. That's asking us about the main idea of the passage and how this line interacts with it. So let's look at lines 24 to 28, starting with when and ending with made, and see how it interacts with what we already know about the passage. Do you have a pretty good idea of the main idea of this passage? I think it's pretty clear. Abe Lincoln does not want people breaking the law for any reason. Okay, now let's find out what these lines have to say about that, 24 to 28. When I so pressingly urge a strict observance of all the laws, let me not be understood as saying there are no bad laws, nor that grievances may not arise for the redress of which no legal provisions have been made. <coughs> oh, pardon me. <laughs> Hopefully they edit that out. Sorry to all y'all wearing headphones. I hope I didn't uh, blast your eardrums too much there. So what's Lincoln saying here? When I so pressingly urge a strict observance of all the laws, let me not be understood as saying there are no bad laws, nor that grievances may not arise for the redress of which no legal provisions have been made. Seems to be saying here, we know that he, as he says, is urging a strict observance of all the laws. We get that. There's no new information there. Now he's saying, let me not be understood as saying there are no bad laws, nor that grievances may not arise for the redress of which uh, legal provisions have been made. So he's saying, don't misunderstand me, basically. I'm not saying there's no bad laws. He goes on to tell us what he's not saying. I'm not saying there's no bad laws, and I'm not saying that there might not be grievances. Grievances are issues that you take with someone or something. If you have a list of grievances against someone, they're things that you are holding against them. And he's saying, if grievances arise, the redress or like the repairing or the fixing 
of those grievances, those should be done legally. Those have been, should be done with what has been provided legally, legal provisions. So he's saying, let me not be understood as saying. He says, here's what I'm not saying. And you guys might be familiar with this sort of strategy. Have you ever prepared something that you really want someone to understand? You really want someone to understand your point of view, but you know that they're gonna misunderstand what you're saying. So you prepare like this whole line of like, now I know you're gonna say that I'm saying this, but I'm not. You sort of have this idea of what people are going to think you're going to say. So we get what he's doing here. Let's find which option lines up with what we already know. It raises and refutes a potential counter argument to Lincoln's argument. Well, the counter argument is possible, but he doesn't really prove anything wrong. He doesn't really say, now you say this and you're wrong. He's more saying, I'm not saying this. So I don't really like A. B, it identifies and concedes a crucial shortcoming of Lincoln's argument. Well, a shortcoming would be something that's weak about your argument, something that doesn't quite hold together. And Lincoln doesn't really seem to be saying this. He might be using words like, I admit that, if he were showing a weakness in his argument. But he's not admitting to anything here. It acknowledges and substantiates a central assumption of Lincoln's argument. So acknowledge, that just means to look at, right? Substantiate. You can see the root word in there is substance. That means we're giving it substance. We're giving a central part of Lincoln's argument the sort of solid bedrock that it needs. But he doesn't give that here. He doesn't really give an argument. Again, he gives what his argument isn't. So I don't like C either. The only choice I have left is option D. It anticipates and correct a possible misinterpretation of Lincoln's argument. Now that I like. It says, I know you might misinterpret me. You might misconstrue what I'm saying, but don't understand me as saying this thing. D is our answer. Now, we've only done half of the reading but we've worked through these few questions. We haven't even read passage two. Can you imagine how hard it would have been to answer those questions if we had read another passage in between reading the first passage and answering these? It would have totally messed up our heads. But now we can move on to passage two, which we're going to treat as, again, its own test. So what do we do first? With a new test, we read the blurb. It says passage two is from Henry David Thoreau. He wrote Resistance to Civil Government, originally published in 1849. Well, okay, if Thoreau is resisting the government, there's a chance that he might take issue with what Abe Lincoln says. There's a chance that he will disagree. So let's look at what passage two says. Let's sandwich. The first sentence says, unjust laws exist. Shall we be content to obey them or shall we endeavor to amend them and obey them until we have succeeded or shall we transgress them all at once or just transgress them at once? All right, asks a crucial question that gives us a good hint at his main idea. Then it says here, why does it cry and resist before it is hurt? 
We don't really know what he's talking about, but we don't need to. Right now we're just sandwiching. If the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of government, let it go, let it go. Perchance it will wear smooth. Certainly the machine will wear out. All right, so he uses a pretty, uh, a pretty strong metaphor there to talk about injustice. Again, just like Abe Lincoln wasn't talking about actual blood, Thoreau's not talking about actual machines. We'll get into that a little later. What I have to do is to see at any rate that I do not lend myself to the wrong which I condemn. As for adopting the ways which the state has provided for remedying the evil, I know not of such ways. Okay, so he doesn't seem to really be a big fan of the way that government sets up its own correction. Remember these legal provisions over here in passage one? When he says, I know not of them, probably doesn't mean that he actually doesn't know what they are. He just might take issue with it. A man has not everything to do, but something, and because he cannot do everything, it is not necessary that he should do something wrong. That's a mouthful. I'll be honest, the first time I read this, it took me a couple times to understand it, but we're just sandwiching the passage now. We don't need to know what it's really saying. We'll come back to it if the questions tell us it's necessary. Now, here's an easy thing to miss. Part of passage two leaks over into the question section. We have this final paragraph that we might have missed if we weren't careful. I do not hesitate to say that those who call themselves abolitionists should at once effectually withdraw their support, both in person and property, from the government. Okay, so he's talking about abolitionists, the people who were for the abolition of slavery. Moreover, any man more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one already. All right, so it seems like Thoreau is, uh, is going to rub against some of Lincoln's ideas. He's going to take issue with them, but let's see what the questions are. We're not reading it yet. We're still doing the bird's eye view because we're treating this like a new test. So let's look at the passage two questions. In passage two, Thoreau indicates that some unjust aspects of government are fill in the blank. Well, this seems like a broad question, right? It's asking about a whole passage. Here's the thing. Question number 39 is actually connected to it. Which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? Guys, this is something the SAT test writers like to do all the time because they are the worst. They like to take these connected questions and separate them by a column or a page break. So what should you take away from this? If you find a bold question or a broad question, if you find a broad question at the end of a page or at the end of a column, always, always, always look at the next column or the next page to see if there's not a connecting question that'll help narrow down the broadness a little bit more. So thanks to our keen eyes, we've noticed that 38 and 39 are connected line questions. So we move on. we get something like this. The primary purpose of each passage is to, oh, okay. So these are no longer just broad questions. We probably thought we were getting off a little easy, right? We weren't getting a whole lot of questions about main ideas that didn't have us look at the specific lines to help us out. But these, you're going to want to save for the very, very last because these aren't just asking for the main idea of one passage. 
These are asking for the main idea of both. This is what I would sort of call a mega broad question. And spoiler alert, 41 and 42 are also both mega broad questions. We see based on the passages and based on the passages. Now we do want to make note that the line is referenced here. So they're not totally throwing us to the sharks for these last couple questions, but they are going to be very broad. And I'll walk through how we'll sort of visualize and think of these two authors interacting with each other. All right, so as we get into our line questions first, right? Because we haven't been given any vocab and context. Only the line questions here. In passage two, Thoreau indicates that some unjust aspects of government are. Now, we know that the answer is going to be in one of these four sections. So we're going to look at these four sections and we're going to look for what are the key things in number 38 that would actually have to be existing in those lines. Well, again, we know it's going to be Thoreau because it's Thoreau the whole passage. It's his. What we have here are unjust aspects of government. Now, are we going to see the exact phrase unjust aspects of government? Mm, probably not. No. We're probably going to find some words that mean the same thing. So let's think of our own synonyms for these. Key phrases. Uh, unjust. We could probably think of a few words already, like unfair. Um, we could think of biased, perhaps uh prejudiced maybe some unjust aspects of government and government might have any number of synonyms we might see something about the law um we might be something see something about powers or powers that be but the big key word here i would look for is unjust what's unfair what is thoreau saying about the parts of government that are not fair all right, so we know it has to be one of these four. So let's look through it together. Option A, lines 45 to 48, starting with unjust. Oh, I like that beginning. And ending with once. All right, again, I'm going to take away these sandwiching lines so that they don't distract us. All right, so lines 45 to 48, starting at unjust and ending in once. Unjust laws exist. Shall we be content to obey them or shall we endeavor to amend them and obey them until we have succeeded or shall we transgress them at once? What's Thoreau saying here? Well, he says unjust laws exist, and then he asks a question where he gives sort of three options. We could obey them, we could try and change them, and obey them then, or we can break them right now. Three options. He doesn't tell us which one to do, and so really all he's saying about unjust laws is that they exist. Okay, bold stance, Thoreau. Um, we can really cut away that one right away because it's not saying much at all. Lines 51 to 52, starting with they and ending with evil. They think that if they should resist, the remedy would be worse than the evil. 
Okay, well, we'll probably have to read the sentence in between here just to get an idea of who they are. Men generally, under such a government as this, think that they ought to wait until they have persuaded the majority to alter them. They think that if they should resist, the remedy would be worse than the evil. All right, so Thoreau is giving the opinion of other men. He's not giving the opinion of himself. So really, Thoreau's not indicating his opinion here about unjust aspects of government or about anything. He's talking about what other people think. So I don't like B. Option C says, well, it starts with if the injustice and ends with go. If the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of government, let it go, let it go. So we're highlighting um, this part of the passage. If the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of government, let it go, let it go. What do we think he's saying here? Well, again, like Lincoln isn't talking about literal blood, Thoreau isn't really talking about a literal machine. He's talking about necessary friction of the machine of government. We don't have to sit with this real long, but we can realize pretty quickly that the words injustice and government are both here. And he's not saying this is what other men feel, and he's not posing a question. So of our options, so far C is the best. Let's see if D is better. 75 to 78, starting with a man and ending with the word wrong. A man has not everything to do, but something. And because he cannot do everything, it is not necessary that he should do something wrong. Wow, okay, let's read that again. A man has not everything to do, but something. And because he cannot do everything, it is necessary that he should do something wrong. Maybe you guys read that and you got it right away. It took me a couple goes. But what it's essentially saying, I think, is that we can't do everything, a person can't do everything, but that doesn't mean they have to do the wrong thing. Now, I could waste a lot of time breaking my brain trying to figure out what that means. Meanwhile, like the test clock is ticking and I'm wasting my time. Right away though, I see that this has nothing to do with unjust aspects of government. So that cancels out the right away. I really don't even need to know what it means. I just need to know that it doesn't serve my purposes as I'm leading with the questions. So I like C. If the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of government, let it go, let it go. And we're going to look at that and try and see what he's actually saying and put it in our own words. Well, he seems to be saying at the very least here that there is injustice. He's admitted that already. Sometimes that injustice is in the government, and sometimes that injustice is necessary, meaning it's needed. So what should we do when there's a needed injustice in our government? What does Thoreau say we should do? He says we should ignore it. He says we should let it go. And if we keep reading, we'll see that Perchance it will wear smooth. Certainly the machine will wear out. So let's see what our options are. He's saying that some of these injustices are necessary or needed parts of government. 
Well, Thoreau indicates in passage two that some unjust aspects of government are A, superficial and can be fixed easily. No, he doesn't really tell us that we can fix them easily. He doesn't really tell us we can fix them at all. So I don't like A. B, subtle and must be studied carefully. No, he doesn't tell us to study. He tells us to pretty much let it go, to not do anything about it. So I don't like B. C, self-correcting and may be beneficial. Now, this one is sort of giving us the choice between a good answer and a great answer. Because later on in the passage, it does say that it might wear smooth and that it, but, so, so this, this may tempt us to say that like, yeah, he says it'll get better on its own. He says it'll self-correct. But does he say that it will be beneficial? Well, he says that it'll be necessary, right? Which isn't quite the same thing. Just because something's needed doesn't mean that it's good. So let's see if D is any better. Inevitable and should be endured. Yeah, I like that one the best. Inevitable just means we can't change it. It's going to happen and we should endure it. We should allow it to happen. We should, as Thoreau puts it here, let it go. So C is not really our, our best bet, though it is a contender. You could make a case for it, but here we're not choosing between a bad answer and a good answer. We're choosing between a good answer and the best answer. Okay, so now we're coming on to the mega broad questions. We're looking at number 40, and it says the primary purpose of each passage is to. Okay, here's the big thing you need to know for the mega broad questions. When you're dealing with questions that are dealing with two passages at once, you need to sort of think of it like a Venn diagram. Hopefully you guys remember these. Right, you have one circle over here, one over here, and there's an overlap in the middle. So let's say over here is Lincoln's passage, and over here is Thoreau's passage. Now again, we're not talking about Lincoln the man, we're not talking about what we know about him as a historical figure, we're only talking about the passage, it's a reading test. So really, we could write this another way just by saying it's Lincoln or it's passage one. And it's Thoreau, AKA passage two. Now, these mega broad questions are going to be asking about how these two passages interact. So let's look at this first mega broad question, the primary purpose of each passage is to do something. Well, that means that we're being asked about what inhabits the overlap of the circle. If we find things that are true about Lincoln, but aren't true about Thoreau, we're not interested in it. If we find things that are true about Thoreau, but aren't true about Lincoln, we're not interested. We're only interested in what inhabits the overlap, right? Only interested in what's true about each passage. So let's look at what we've got. Now we can ask ourselves, we can form our own answer. What is true of each passage? Well, they're both sort of making an opinion about what we should do about unjust laws, right? Um, Lincoln seems to think we should follow them all the time and change them if we don't like them. Uh, Thoreau seems to have a little bit more nuance. He's not, he's not so sure that we should follow every law all the time. 
So, but what do they have in common? Option A says, make an argument about the difference between legal duties and moral imperatives. What's a moral imperative? That's something that you do not because it's the law, but because you feel in your conscience it's right. You feel it's moral. Now, I don't think that these passages have spent a lot of time discussing the differences between these two. So I don't really like A. Ooh. Yeah, I don't love A. B says that both of these passages discuss how laws ought to be enacted and changed in a democracy. Well, we do have some, some statements about how they can be changed. Really, those statements are just saying that they can be changed, though. Thoreau literally says, I know not of the ways they can be changed. So he clearly isn't thinking about them much. B is better than A, but I hope we can find something better. Advance a view regarding whether individuals should follow all of the country's laws. I like that best so far. I'm going to mark C, which means I'm eliminating B. These passages are both trying to convince us of a particular way of thinking about whether or not we should follow all the laws in our country. Now, if we look at D, it says articulate standards by which laws can be evaluated as just or unjust. If this were true of both the passages, we would expect them to say something like, Here's how you can tell if a law is fair, right? They would be giving us standards. I haven't seen that in anything we've read. And you think it would have come up in at least one of the passages if it has to be true of both of them. So for that reason, I like C the best. Now, looking at question number 41, based on the passages, Lincoln would most likely describe the behavior that Thoreau recommends in lines 64 and 66 as, okay, so this is a little bit more interesting for our Venn diagram. This is no longer asking about what sits in the overlap of these two ideas. This is now asking that it's asking about a particular part of Thoreau, lines 64 to 66, and it's saying, based on passage one, what would Lincoln have to say about passage two? Based on what we know from Lincoln over here, what would he have to say about Thoreau over here? Well, we can't really know that until we look at Thoreau's passage, right? So let's see, 64 to 66, starting with if it and ending with law. If it is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then I say, break the law. Whoa, okay, so Thoreau does actually have an opinion about when we should break the law. He seems to think that we should break it if it's asking us to act unjustly or unfairly to someone else. Now, without even thinking about it, we already kind of know what Lincoln would think of this, right? Lincoln thinks we should follow all the laws all the time, or else we are, what did he say? Trampling on the blood of our father and tearing the character of our own and our children's liberty. So I don't think he would agree with Thoreau over here. So we have a general idea. Let's see what options we're given. Would Lincoln say that this is an excusable reaction to an intolerable situation? No, I don't think Lincoln would say that you can excuse breaking the law in any sort of instance. So I don't like A. 
B, a rejection of the country's proper forms of remedy. Yeah, that's probably the closest to what we've seen Lincoln say, because remember, he talks about these legal provisions, these proper ways to repair the laws. An honorable response to an unjust law. No, again, I don't think that Lincoln would think that breaking the law is honorable, regardless of whether the law is good or bad. I don't really like C. Or D, a misapplication of a core principle of the Constitution. Well, if this were true, we would have to see Lincoln talk about the Constitution's core principle in a very specific way, right? But when we look at Lincoln talking about the Constitution, first of all, we haven't run into it at all in the lines. But if we're to read the passage a little more carefully, he talks about the Constitution very generally. He says, support the Constitution and laws. OK, cool, Lincoln. He's not really talking about a core principle of the Constitution, just that we should support it in general. So while D might be a good answer, I think B is for sure our best answer. We're rejecting the country's proper forms of remedy. Remedy is healing, it's a cure, it's how you fix something. And Lincoln thinks there are proper legal ways to fix what is broken. Okay, our last question is a doozy. Based on the passages, one commonality in the stances Lincoln and Thoreau take toward abolitionism is, so if we're talking about commonality, that would mean we're only interested again in the overlap. We're not interested in what's, what's only true over here, right? We're not interested in what's only true over here. We're only interested in what's true of both of these things as it pertains to abolitionism. To the abolition of slavery. Well, this would require us to, to look at the passage a little closer. And it's a tricky question because when we look at the passage and we're skimming for the words abolitionism, right? You may have caught it here at the very end of Lincoln's passage. Now, what does he say about it? He says, in any case that arises as, for instance, the promulgation, that means the spread of abolitionism, it's becoming bigger, one of two positions is necessarily true. That is, the thing is right within itself and therefore deserves the protection of all law and all good citizens, or it is wrong and therefore proper to be prohibited by legal enactments. So what does he say about abolitionism? Well, he says it's either right or it's wrong. He doesn't really take a stand. He says it's either this or it's that but he doesn't tell us which one it is. Now, this is where history and reading tests become important because we know from history that Lincoln had much stronger stances on abolition later on in his career. But based on this passage, he doesn't say much about it. He really only says that it's either right or wrong. Well, let's see what Thoreau says. I do not hesitate to say that those who call themselves abolitionists should at once effectually withdraw their support, both in person and property from the government and not wait till they constitute a majority of one before they suffer the right to prevail through them. I think that it is enough if they have God on their side without waiting for that other one. So Thoreau seems to be saying that abolitionists should withdraw their support from the government, i.e., if you don't believe slavery is, is just, 
if you believe that slavery is wrong, then you should break the law. You should break that law in particular. Now notice, he doesn't call himself an abolitionist. He says, those who call themselves abolitionists. Now what's true of both of these? Well, we might not be able to spot much that they have in common, but let's look at, but we have a good idea of what both people are saying. So let's look at what these answers have for the overlap. Both authors see the cause as warranting drastic action, like severe response. And no, I don't see Lincoln that, and I sure don't see Thoreau saying that. So I don't like A. Both authors view the cause as central to their argument. Well, if they viewed it as central, I don't think they would have both put it in the last paragraph of their essay. So I don't like B. C, neither author expects the cause to win widespread acceptance. Well, no, neither of them really make predictions about abolition. Thoreau says, here's what you should do if you are an abolitionist, you should break, pardon me, here's what you should do, you should break the law. And Lincoln says that abolition is either right or wrong. He doesn't really say, and more and more people will like it. Like not, neither of them say that. And even if only one of them said that, we wouldn't be interested. We're only interested in what inhabits the overlap. So I don't like C for that reason. D, neither author embraces the cause as his own. Yeah, unfortunately that's true. These authors don't in this text state that they are abolitionists. They don't say that it's warranting drastic action. They don't say that it's central to their argument. And they don't really predict whether it's going to win widespread acclaim. What do they say about abolition? Not much. And so D is our only answer. It's the only one that's left. And it's the only one that makes sense with our understanding of the passage. Whew. All right, take a deep breath, guys. We just worked through one of the hardest types of passages you can work through in reading comprehension. We entered into two different authors' thoughts and opinions, two different authors' words and ways of writing, and we talked about how those two different passages interacted with each other, where the overlap sat, and how one author might think about something the other author said. Again, if you take nothing else, absolutely treat these double header passages as two separate tests. Go through all the steps for passage one, go through all the steps for passage two, and then answer any broad questions that may be left at the end. Well, guys, again, my name is Mr. Scott. I work with Embrace Tutoring. If you're interested in receiving a private session from me over Zoom or in person, you can email info at embracetutoring.com. That's info at embracetutoring.com. And we can try and set up a session. But uh, good work tonight. And um, we'll see you soon.